Hey guys, it's Lane the Blade from Refined Horizons, and this is a training video I want to do on the chapter, first chapter of Brown's Boundary Control and Legal Principles. I actually remembered the book. I have a slightly older edition. This is the fourth edition. Uh, Brown's Boundary Control and Legal Principles is basically the Bible for boundary surveying in the United States. It's a good book. It's what I learned in college. So I'm going to hopefully do a video or or a set of videos. it would probably be at least one video for each chapter, and I hope to get all the way through Brown's. So I'm not trying to replace Brown's, just trying to help people that are, you know, maybe you didn't go to college and you're uh, trying to get licensed as a land surveyor, and so you're reading through Brown's. Hopefully these videos will help, or maybe you're in college, <laughs> and uh, you're looking for some extra help to understand Brown's. So hopefully these, these videos will help with that. And... Um, Put these to videos together for my team, but I'm going to share them on the internet. And, uh, not going to be super formal. It's going to be way informal, uh, just because that allows me to be more productive, get more done, more of the videos done. So these aren't going to be smoothly edited and, um, you're going to probably hear dogs barking and you might hear my wife singing in the background. So full disclaimer there. Um, so <clears throat> we're going to get into Browns. Chapter one of Browns, um, Brown, what do I, how, I'm trying to think about how I want to say this without offending people. Brown's is a great book, and there's a lot of important things in Brown's, Boundary Control and Legal Principles, and Brown's Boundary Control and Legal Principles, this book does a really, 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 really valuable thing that we, we as a profession would be so, we'd be so, uh, I don't know what the word is. It just, this book provides a really valuable service, and surveying would be uh, much harder without this book. So what is that? What what does this book do? This book basically takes the decisions about boundary surveying that are in the common law, so court decisions, and puts it in a single volume and tries to teach surveyors how, how it applies to their work. And that's really valuable, because otherwise land surveyors would like have to read through all the common law or get sued, <laughs> or somebody else would have had to write this book. Uh, but they don't have to because we have it. So Brown's is a really valuable book. Um, having said that, I find as I return to it now after about 15 or 20 years that there are parts of this book that are way harder to understand than I remembered. Um, that's probably because I had a good college professor. So chapter one of Brown's in particular, um, I found uh, that the authors kind of jumped all over uh, uh, the place and it was hard for me to piece together at least related pieces of information because they weren't all grouped together. So what I did in my study notes, so I've got these study notes. I'll put them online. It's going to be on my personal website, I think, landonblake.com, not my business website. <clears throat> and uh, you're going to be able to get down with these study notes. I'm doing the same thing for the other books that I'm going through. And uh, I'll, I'll try and link to the study notes in the YouTube video comments as well. But these study notes follow a common format, so I just list you the key key terms and their definitions in the beginning, and then uh, then I get into the key concepts. So I'm not going to go through the definitions, key key con uh, key terms in these videos. I encourage you to download the study notes and look at those because we're going to talk about the, the terms as we move through the key concepts. Um, but what I did on chapter one of Browns in particular is usually these study notes will follow the. The key concepts will follow the subheadings in the chapter. I did not do that for chapter one of Browns. I reorganized the information a little bit in a, in a manner that made it was more logical for me. So it does not follow the exact pattern of Browns. Uh, and hopefully I didn't do people a disservice in that. Um, maybe the, the layout of chapter one makes a lot of sense to other people, but just I, I struggled with it. So I, I reformatted it a little bit. <clears throat> It's all the same content. I just grouped it a little bit differently. I will also mention I'm not going through every part of Browns. Um, I'm going through the parts that I think are really important um, and that you need to get licensed. There's a lot of really valuable background information in Browns. For example, in Chapter 1, they talk a lot about the history of boundary, boundary surveying. I'm not going to get into a bunch of that. Um, I encourage you to buy the book. Uh, get it. Don't pay freaking sticker price for the cover edition. <laughs> get a used copy on Amazon. Uh, but it's a good book. You should have it in your library if you're going to be a surveyor. 
This is really good information too, not just for surveyors, but for land title folks, especially for land title folks and for other people that work in real estate, but especially land title people. Okay, so we're going to cover the, some of the key concepts and Browns, and I probably won't do them all in this video. I'll probably break this up. Uh, but these are the, what, the, these are the major groupings of information that I, that I took out of chapter one. So the first is, uh, the importance of measurements and other evidence, the role of the land surveyor in the United States cadastral system, land surveyors and boundary disputes. So kind of what is the surveyor's role in boundary disputes? Um, real estate legal concepts for surveyors. So chapter one covers just a lot of basic real estate law that that land surveyors need to know about. That's a big section, so that probably be its own video. And then uh, governing law for boundary surveys. So what what rules we have to follow as land surveyors? Okay, so that's kind of a, an overview of how I group the information in chapter one. What I'd like to do is maybe get through the first three three key concepts that I got out of chapter one, and then we'll do maybe we'll do one more video. Okay, so let's go ahead and start. So here's my first key concept from chapter one of Browns. That is that uh, measurements and other evidence are very important to land surveyors. So measurements and words and deeds, excuse me, measurements and words in deeds and other documents are the legal foundation for boundaries. Okay, so what are, how do we define boundaries in the United States legal system? We do it with words and measurements. That's what Brown's trying to tell you. So let's break that down a little bit and talk about it. What do we mean by measurements? Uh, primarily, we're talking about bearings and distances, um, although uh, it could also be area. In some cases, a boundary might be controlled by an elevation. So, for example, I had a project I worked on where uh, the deed followed the contour around the reservoir at contour at a certain elevation. Those are kind of unique things. Usually, when we're talking about measurements, surveyors are talking about bearings and distances. Okay, but there could be other things, area, elevation, maybe some things I'm not thinking of at the top of my head. Um, and words, okay, and you're going to see a lot of this information in Chapter 1 of Brown's ties in with the book that uh, William Cole wrote on land tenure. I've got a set of videos on that, too. There's going to be a lot of overlap between Chapter 1 and 2 of the book on land tenure and Chapter 1 of Brown's. So they cover some of the same ground from, from slightly different perspectives. So <clears throat> what do we mean by words? So we say measurements and words are the foundation of legal foundation of boundaries. So... Generally, when we say words, that has a very broad meaning, but I'll, I'm going to narrow it down in an effort to make it understandable. You know, mostly we're talking about what, what surveyors describe as controlling calls. So those are descriptions for descriptions of uh, controlling elements, elements that control the location of the boundary. Okay, so uh, for example, a call for a monument could be an artificial monument like an iron pipe, could be a natural monument like the center of center line of a creek. Could be called what we call call for an adjoiner. So, the lands of Huerta on the south, the lands of Blake on the east, those are calls for adjoiners. So, those are the type of words that we're talking about that Browns is talking about. And the book on land tenure, William William Cole calls those landmarks. So he talks about measurements and landmarks. Brown talks about measurements and words. Okay, so measurements and words and deeds or other documents like survey maps. Those are the foundation of boundaries in our legal system in the United States. Okay. Surveyors use measurements to create boundaries. So we get some idea of uh, what the uh, landowner wants to do when he's creating a subdivision and we'll go out and, and make some measurements, figure out what he has, and then we'll, you know, we use mathematics, algebra and trigonometry to create bearings and distances to describe the new parcels in essence. Okay. And that's it in modern surveying. That's the subdivision process that we go through. Okay. So Brown says surveyors use measurements to create boundaries. And then we also use measurements to retrace or relocate and identify. Relocate and identify is the term that Brown's use. Retrace is what I say. Uh, we use measurements to retrace boundaries. So after a boundary has been created by a subdivision, we go in and try and, and put that boundary back on the ground and we use measurements to do that. Okay. He points out that uncertainty in boundary surveying occurs during retracement. So it doesn't typically occur during subdivision, but it occurs during retracement.
because we're trying to follow another surveyor's footsteps based on the evidence left that he left behind. And there's always potential for multiple interpretations of the evidence. So that's why there's usually some degree of uncertainty in boundary surveying, especially when you're doing retracement surveys. So, you know, one of the big problems we have in land surveying is the quality of the evidence de deteriorates over time. It gets destroyed. Public agencies like the payover monuments that we set in the road. That's a huge problem in California. Um, so it, you know, with the passage of time, it gets more and more difficult to, uh, to put the boundary back in the same spot that the original surveyor had it. And, you know, there's a little joke. If you ask 10 surveyors where the boundary is, you're going to get 10 different answers. That's what Brown's talking about, multiple interpretations of the evidence. Okay, so that's kind of key concept number one. I felt like in the chapter, measurements and other evidence are important. You know, what do we mean when we say other evidence? Well, so it's not just measurements. It's the words in those documents, those deeds and maps. Um, it's also physical evidence. So we're looking at um, evidence. You know, we might be examining... Uh, physical marker we found that, you know, claims to be the marker of a property corner, that somebody claims to be the marker of a property corner. So we're going to examine that evidence, you know, is that what the surveyor said he said? You know, has it been disturbed? What condition it is, is it in? Do we think it's still in the original position? You know, that's, that's what we're talking about in evidence. With evidence. So it's not just measurements. It's also words and documents. It could be words. It could be oral testimony from a landowner or another surveyor. Could be physical evidence, like what did we actually find on the ground. All right, so the next thing, the next what kind of logical grouping key concept I had was the role of the land surveyor. So Browns talks a lot about what is the role of the land surveyor in our uh, cadastral system. Uh, the book on land tenure gets into that a little bit, but Browns dives in even deeper. So Browns is kind of teaching us in chapter one what the role of the surveyor is. So the land surveyor should be an expert measurer measurement maker, and collector of data, and collector of evidence related to land boundaries. So surveyors need to be good at measurement, they need to be good at collecting data, and they need to be good at collecting evidence. Brown doesn't really get into detail about what he means by data, but essentially, you know, collecting measurement data, that's important. You know, definitely surveyors in our modern era have to know how to work with data of all different, all, all different types, but especially measurement data. So a land surveyor needs to be an excellent measurement maker. He needs to be a collector of data and a collector of evidence. We talked about what kind of evidence surveyors need to collect. What does a surveyor do? He locates the boundaries of land on the surface of the earth, but also above and below the surface of the earth. So Brown's uh, chapter one makes a really, they go out of their way to make the point that surveying, boundary surveying is in three dimensional. Okay, so it's not just what's on the surface. It can be below what's below. Mineral rights, as an example, or above airspace rights, as an example. And the book on land tenure talks about that as well. Land surveyors interpret legal descriptions of land, what I call land descriptions, other people call legal descriptions, and we place them on the ground, and they do this by conducting surveys to recover evidence of previous surveys. That is such a powerful statement. Like, it's one sentence, but it's such an important sentence, right? That's what land surveyors do, in essence, boundary surveyors what boundary surveyors do. We take written descriptions of property and we put them on the ground for people. Like, where is the boundary in relation to this fence, this driveway, this building, right, this well? That's what we do. We take a boundary that somebody's created, we go out and we look for evidence that other surveyors have left behind, we try and put that boundary back on the ground where it belongs, in a nutshell. Great. Browns. There's a gym in Browns chapter one. I'm going to read it one more time. It's so fundamental. Land surveyors interpret legal descriptions of land and place them on the ground. They do this by conducting surveys to recover evidence of previous surveys. Really important principle there. Hopefully you can, that makes sense. Hopefully it'll make more sense as we go through the book. So it's not just uh, land ownership that, sorry, that was a dog toy. It's not just land land ownership that surveyors mark, uh, but Browns uh, brings out they may be asked to locate limits of possession, limits of ownership claims, what people claim they own, and to locate improvements on property, and to locate or describe describe rights and interests in lands. So we do a lot more than just survey ownership, right? We survey possession, we survey physical improvements, we survey what people claim they own, and we survey rights on land. So easements and leases is an example of that. Okay, sir. Um, 
He talks a little bit about um, something called pseudo measurements. That's probably a topic for a whole other video, but he mentions it, and I thought it was important. Uh, it was worth a mention. So he talks about you know GIS and GPS have enabled a lot of people to do to not to survey, but to create pseudo measurements that that ignorant people use in place of actual survey measurements. Um, so we have to be careful about that. You know, if you think about somebody running around with a GPS receiver you know, tagging what they think is a property corner and then putting that in a land parcel GIS. That information could be really dangerous, potentially, based on who's using it. So he mentions that, pseudo measurements. Maybe I'll do another video on that. It's an interesting topic. So he says, look, if you're a land surveyor, you at least have to understand something about the hocus pocus those people are doing because it's going to it's going to uh, impact your work. And I think he's there's some truth to that. Here's another really important concept. This is another gem in Brown's chapter one. Uh, he says that land surveyors uh, don't have the authority to create binding boundary locations uh, in the United States. Only courts have the power to do that. That's not true in all countries. But in the United States, when I do a boundary survey, I'm, I'm really just offering an opinion of that survey. An opinion of where the, excuse me, an opinion of where that boundary is on the ground. Um, so my decisions about where to put that boundary are not binding on the parties. Uh, if they want to fight about it, they can. They can go to court and they can fight about it. And ultimately, a judge will make a decision on whether I'm right or wrong. So that's a that's an important concept uh, in the United States. Some places are not like that. In some places, surveyors have the legal authority to um, say where the boundary is. And that decision is final, uh, which would be interesting. I'd, I'd love to hear some more about uh, those kinds of those kinds of cadastral systems. So if you're in a country where that's the rule, I'd love it if you'd reach out to me. I'd like to talk to you more about that. It's not our system in the United States, though. <clears throat> and then he brings out that uh, questions about land title. So that's you know how you prove who owns what land. That's land title, right? Who owns what? How do you prove it? Um, he says that's typically been the domain of lawyers, but over time, courts have uh, relied more and more on surveyors' opinions about land title because we deal a lot with land title. It's a big part of what we do. Okay, so I want to get into this next section and then we'll end this video. I know it went a little longer than I wanted, but... So the next key concept, kind of logical grouping I have for Brown's Chapter 1 is he talks a lot about the land surveyor's role in boundary disputes. I don't know why Brown's Chapter 1 spends so much time uh, talking about boundary disputes um, I don't know if that's because that's the type of work uh, that that Browns and his colleagues did. They did a lot of that work, and I do some of that work. I've done some expert witness work and, and worked in boundary disputes. Uh, but he talks about it a lot. My experience, um, and I'm it, I'm only one man, <laughs> but in my limited experience, uh, boundary uh, surveyors do not spend a great deal of their time on boundary disputes. Most surveyors. There are a few of us that specialize in that, but, but your typical boundary surveyor is not spending a lot of time in court. Um, so I'm not sure why Brown focuses on that so much in Chapter 1, but it is important, and, and you could, at any time in, in reality, a surveyor could have his survey end up uh, as part of a dispute that goes to court. But he talks about it uh, quite a bit, so I'm going to talk about it. Uh, so in the event of a boundary dispute, uh, the land surveyor, what does he do? What's his role? He presents measurements and other evidence of boundary location to the court. So we present evidence and opinions. Okay. Uh, we can also uh, be called on to testify and provide opinions that help the judge and jury to understand complicated areas of the law related to their work. And I've been in that situation before when I've been trying to explain principle, legal principles of land surveying to a judge. Uh, it's a very uncomfortable position, but it's really important and really valuable. Judges have a lot to... Judges are required to know a huge amount about the law, and so they depend on hopefully neutral experts to help guide them through that. So surveyors do that. Um, as a general rule, we present facts and evidence. We don't advocate for a particular outcomes. So now we, and that, that neutrality to some extent makes us very different from lawyers who are very much advocates for their clients. So we're, we're really not there doing whatever we can to prove our client right. You know, our role is to gather evidence and, and present that. And part of the reason we we should, it doesn't always happen in practice, but part of the reason in theory why we should have that kind of neutrality when we're in court is because we're supposed to protect the public. So we're not supposed to just come up with a solution that takes the land or land rights away from the other guy and gives them to our client because he's our client. We're not supposed to do that. We're, we have a, a duty and obligation to protect the neighbor as much as we do our own client. And so we're supposed to be more, more neutral. 
So Browns, he mentions that. Um, let's see. Judges apply law in boundary disputes. Um, and as a general rule, they decide answers to questions of law. So surveyors pre present evidence, and the judges rule on what the law says about that evidence, basically, is what Brown is saying. Um, as a general rule, if you have a jury involved, Brown talks about this. Uh, the, so the surveyor presents the evidence. The judge applies the law. The jury makes decisions about questions of fact. So a question of fact, um, I'm trying to think of an example. I should have been more prepared for this. So the surveyor um, goes to court and says, I measured the distance between the two, prop, two, two iron pipes as 200 feet, and the deed says 202 feet, and uh, I believe uh, the correct measurement is 200, 200 feet, that 202 feet is a typo. Um, the judge is going to tell the jury, um, here's the rules for how you're going to weigh that testimony that Landon gave you, and then the jury is going to decide, um, is the distance 200 feet or 202 feet? What, what, what is the actual distance? That's a fact that the jury is going to rule on. And then after they, so let's say the jury comes back and they says, we think Landon's, Landon's right, it's 200 feet, not 202 feet, 202 feet's a typo. Then the judge may decide what the consequences of that are in the law, okay? And there's probably a better example. That's what I came up with off the top of my head. Um, in the United States, uh, courts have the exclusive right to determine the meaning of words in a land description and then to determine where that description is on the ground. So we talked about that, uh, Surveyors are quasi-judicial, so most of our boundary surveys don't go to court and our decisions are final. But in theory, a theory in air quotes there, um, we're just expressing opinions when we do a boundary survey. A court has to decide. If you want a final decision, you have to go to a court. So one, one consequence of that that Browns talks about is because ultimately all of our decisions can be undone or held up by a judge, we have to understand how judges think. We got to understand the rules of law that they're going to apply to either hold or throw out our boundary survey. That's one of the reasons why common law is so important for land surveyors. Brown says our work needs to stand up to judicial scrutiny. That's what he calls it. All right, that's probably way longer than I than it needed to be. Uh, we're going to go ahead. I'm going to stop. We're going to do another video, and we're going to go over the, the other two sections of Chapter One from Brown's. Uh, there's one that talks about a basic real estate law for land surveyors and then how boundary surveys are governed, okay, the law that governs boundary surveys. So we'll, we'll do that in another video.